Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I, um, as many of you know, uh, Secretary Gates is next door. And if any of you are here thinking this is the Gates event, um, you're in for an upgrade, I think. <laughs> um, Dick just said that we're going to have. Uh, we're not going to talk about war no, at no, all. And you said it back there that it was almost certainly the case that we will have more laughs because they're, we know they're at zero. And yeah, so I've been able to hear the first half hour, and so far they're at zero. But you know, it might, they might get to the funny part. Yes, the, uh, pretty soon. I am. Um, you and I have met before. Um, do you remember what, the first time we met was at a hotel bar in Rochester? Yes. Um, the only time I've ever talked to someone in a hotel bar in Rochester was you. Um, and then we also had a, and this is what came to mind when I was thinking about this evening. We had a conversation with a mutual friend of ours named Manny, Manny about, um, about analysis. And Manny is very much in favor of psychoanalysis, as am I, and you were very resistant to it. Let's say skeptical. Skeptical, which you're allowed to be when you're at the University of Chicago, that great temple of rationality. But you're here at the 92nd Street Y, where it's safe to say everyone, not just in this room, but also in a 25-block radius uh, of this place, is in analysis. So I, I want to. <laughs> This evening, I would like to encourage you to talk about your feelings. That would, that's how, now, I don't actually, I'm not actually gonna make you lie down on the stage, but as we talk about, as I ask you questions, I would like very much for you to talk about the emotional implications of those okay. questions. I'm, I'm Is that now, all right? I'm, I'm now trying to remember the thought process that got me to ask you to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I know there was something, but, <laughs> But the, I'm blocking on it. Oh, it's okay. Go on. Well, I want to start with um, this book you've written. This lovely, marvelous book you've written is the the history of an insurgency, right? Yeah. See, just like the just like next door. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, I, could you start by simply, as simply as you can, describe the nature of the insurgency? Well, um, economics as a discipline, at least since about 1950, has been a discipline that studies, I would say, fictional creatures. Uh, with a, an appropriate Latin term, I don't know whether it's a genus or what, but homo economicus. And uh, I call them econs. Um, and these creatures have perfect self-control, perfect calculating ability, rational expectations, and no emotions. I, I don't know any of those people. Certainly there are none here. These people are all, you know, nuts. <laughs> and um, so I had the idea in, while I was in graduate school, um, you know, when I was learning these theories, my reaction was, really? And, but uh, I didn't really know what to do about it. And um, lot, I wasn't by any means the first person to point out that economic models were getting less and less realistic. Um, th there were many people who made that point. That was brushed away by Milton Friedman with a, a famous two-word dismissal, as if. So yeah, of course, people aren't really that smart and blah, 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 but we don't care as long as they behave as if they were optimizing. And we should judge a theory based on its predictions, not its assumptions. So, and I think he wrote that in early 1953, and that kind of stood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Herb Simon, uh, another Chicago renegade, came along and had the idea of bounded rationality. But um, I think it's safe to say economists pretty much ignored Simon. And, and he got bored with arguing with them and went off and did other things like artificial intelligence. 
And uh, then I made my biggest discovery in science, which was I discovered these two psychologists, one of whom is sitting here, uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And they had an idea that made my career possible. And the idea was systematic bias. And so, you know, take one of Danny's examples. People are using the availability heuristic. So they're judging frequency by ease of recall. Uh, that's usually pretty good. Uh, but sometimes it will lead to mistakes. So people think there are more homicides than suicides because homicides get more press. Uh, well, notice they're not as if optimizing anymore. And uh, I met a, one of Danny's students uh, at a conference, and he told me about his advisor's work. And I went back and pretty much read all of it in one sitting. And um, said, oh, maybe I could do something with this. This was in what year? Uh, 1976. So talk a little bit, let's talk about, since I wanted you to talk about your feelings. Yes. Give, give some emotional dimension to that. Was it a kind of aha? Was it a slow realization you had something in common? Was it a, well. So, so I would say there was a slow realization f for several years leading up to this point when I met Fischoff, who's the guy, the student of Danny's, who has a famous paper about hindsight, hindsight bias. Yeah. Right. So, um, but reading their papers was an aha moment. Uh, I immediately realized this idea, systematic bias, was the thing that, that I had been missing. So, you know, I tell the story in the book, I had a list of funny behavior. Uh, I had friends over for dinner when I was a graduate student and served a bowl of cashews and cocktails. While dinner was cooking, we started devouring the cashews. And at some point, I took the bowl and hid it in the kitchen, eating a few more as I went to the kitchen. And I came back, and um, we were economics graduate students, so we all started analyzing that. And <laughs> so you, you don't, you, there's, a, you know, there's a rule of thumb. I think we mentioned in Nudge that a dinner party is ruined if more than half the guests come from the economics department. <laughs> so uh, uh, so uh, this is living proof of that. So we, we removed the bowl of cashew nuts, and pretty soon somebody had a napkin and a decision tree and uh, could prove, it's pretty elementary proof, that we had just made ourselves worse off because we removed an option that we kind of liked, which was eating nuts eating cashew nuts. Uh -huh. We used to have that option, now we didn't. But we were happy. That's not allowed. That was probably my very first act of misbehaving, at least in, yeah. in the technical sense. Why, was it, why is it, and was it, particularly was it, an odd thing? I'm assuming it was an odd thing for an economist to read in the psychological literature. Oh, yeah, that's why I claim to have discovered them. I mean, for economists, I did discover them. And um, I had never been to that part of the library. Remember there were libraries? Yes, that's right. <laughs> right? So, but, but, you know, Google Scholar didn't exist, so you went to the library, and this was on a different floor. At the risk of sounding very naive, why, why is it an odd thing for an economist to read psychology? I mean, look, the truth is it's an odd thing for an economist even to read economics that's more than 20 years old. I do a poll of my graduate students. I ask them, how many of you have ever read anything by John Maynard Keynes? Zero. And I make the joke it's on the forbidden reading list at the University of Chicago. But I don't think that would be any different at uh, Harvard or MIT. Mm -hmm. People, if it's more than 20 years old, you know, it's passe. And um, so people barely, I mean, the first year of graduate school, they, 
learn a lot of math and statistics and tools, and then they tend to start getting specialized even within economics. So somebody who's a labor economist doesn't read papers in macro. So psychology, you might as well be reading anthropology or, uh, or you know, Sanskrit. The, and what was, so as this, as this insurgency gets started, what's the kind of reaction? Well, it's not, a, right now it's an insurgency in my mind, yeah. right? I mean, that's not much of an insurgency. Oh, you're talking about in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. I'm just curious, to, to go forward a little bit, um, what is the kind of reaction you get from your colleagues as you start to pursue these ideas? Worried looks. Uh, well, my thesis advisor, Sherwin Rosen, a uh, delightful man. Um, I remember the first time he met Danny, uh, Danny Kahneman sitting in the front row, if you're wondering who I'm pointing at. And um, the first time he met Danny, he told me afterwards, he said, oh, I met your friend Kahneman. Delightful man. Complete bullshit, but really a delightful man. And uh, so Sherwin, uh, was a Chicago-trained economist who went back to Chicago after this little bit in Rochester he spent. And he, he, you know, I told him about some of this stuff and he just told me to get back to work doing serious things. And, I mean, that, he, he like Amos, he died early. Um, and, um, he never thought, really, that anything I was doing was worthwhile. What is it about you that led you to be a subversive in this way? Have you thought about that? Uh, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, somebody asked me recently why I became an academic, and uh, it's clear I'm not really suited to most lines of work that require you to do what somebody asks you to do. I mean, misbehaving refers not just to the people in economic models, but to the author of this book, mm -hmm. uh, and even actually to the way I wrote the book. I mean, this isn't a proper way to write a book. It, it's not a. It's not an autobiography. It's not a textbook. It's not, uh, and it's at least in parts, funny. So everybody told me, you can't, no, no. This is, this is not a proper book. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know any other way to write this book, so that's the way I wrote it. But are you, are you curious as to where this spirit? You really are intent on psychoanalyzing me well, I, in front I, of, you know, I don't know a, how many there, people are there's here. A point, there's a point, that this is gonna lead somewhere, but I just. I hope so. Yeah. I'm just. There's probably an analyst in the room. Oh, there's probably 10 or 15 analysts. Yeah, and, right. You know, is there a doctor in the house means something very different in this part of town. <laughs> um, but no, I'm just curious about when you reflect on this, so you diverged from your profession yeah. uh, quite radically, did something that your own thesis advisor told you was nuts, yeah. consorted with people who economists don't consort with. I mean, I, I could go on. Yeah, yeah. Stop, How do you account for this? You know, uh, that, I mean, I, you know, I don't have that vivid memories of my childhood, but um, <laughs> they're, well-behaved is not a term that I remember anyone applying to me. Were you, were you a, I mean, you, were you a delinquent? No, no, but uh, look, my father was an actuary. Yeah. You know, a very precise man. And uh, he was, until I would say until I was 50, he was disappointed in how things turned out for me <laughs> because I hadn't become an actuary like him. So are you, is, this is the question actually that our mutual friend Manny asked me to ask you. Uh, is your sort of pursuit of behavioral science a form of rebellion against your father? <laughs> I mean, if you, uh, no, no, this is a serious question here because here we have who is not the embodiment, a kind of is formal there anybody embodiment. Anybody good of, at asking questions? <laughs> uh, I mean, 
<laughs> We've just talked about so, you know, the, the, uh, the profession, the discipline to which you belong, had this kind of love affair with this formalized abstract notion of a right. human being. Well, doesn't the actuary have the same love affair? Oh, yeah. I, look, I, I, I did this for the, one of the reasons I didn't become an actuary is the nine exams are just ridiculously hard. And I tried one of them when I was in high school. The first one's a calculus exam. And, oh, that was the hardest calculus exam I had ever seen. And, you know, they get harder from there. So, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I think, I guess you could say, I mean, it's not that I was angry at my father, though. I mean, I, yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm just not well behaved, that's all. It's no, no, nothing more to it than that. Does, are you saying this line of inquiry about sort of the psychological roots of your subversion doesn't interest you? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that I would be disappointed if it were the only topic we discussed tonight. But can I just, before we move on eventually, can I point out the irony of this? You, you see where I'm going. Uh, Here you are critiquing yeah. your profession for its lack of interest in the psychological dimension of human beings. <laughs> and as, you, as we examine your own <laughs> career, you're showing a distinct lack of interest in the psychological dimension of your own approach to economics. Um, are you guilty of the very thing you've been denouncing all these years? Clearly not. You're, conf uh, you know, as many lay people do, Malcolm. <laughs> oh, no, that's not, I don't think that's a criticism. I no, no, I mean, uh, well-educated lay person, but you are confusing cognitive and social psychology, experimental psychology, with clinical psychology. And, you know, uh, experimental psychologists are not interested in these kinds of questions. Now, come on. <laughs> we'll, we'll fight this out but, at drinks. No, no, later. we can. But no, I, I do think, though, it's interesting, though, to me that, uh, that the, uh, how difficult this, it, it goes to the, a, a sort of a central point, I think, in a lot of your work, which is that um, how difficult it, uh, it is for us to incorporate these two sort of modes of understanding hum human behavior, right? That it, I don't mean this is a criticism at all, but even you who has done more than almost anyone else to try and expand the horizons of your profession has difficulty expanding the horizons of your profession. Well, yeah, it's, it's hard, and look, there are e even the... Uh, so to take to give a, attempt a serious answer at this question, mm -hmm. there are the ways in which we've been able to behavioralize economics are extremely limited, mm -hmm. and I mean I sometimes call it Kahneman Tversky economics. Um, we, uh, our friend George Lowenstein has done some work on emotions, but most of the human repertoire mm -hmm. is left out. Uh, and it's because what we, all we're able to do so far, we, I never set out to create a new discipline. So I don't think there should be a new department of behavioral economics or, or, or some new word. Um, be, and the, the standard economic models are, are indispensable for what we do because we use them as a benchmark. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm a critic of my friend Gene Fama's efficient market hypothesis, but none of my research would have been possible without him as a straw man. And we don't have straw man models of things like emotions. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, the, we have no models. Of, and so it, it, it's hard to, for an economist to make, I mean, that 
that will be a very big leap. Yeah. And uh, there's nobody in sight. Uh, but, you know, hopefully there's some grad student somewhere with deviant thoughts who thinks, like you, that I've left most of the interesting stuff for someone else to do. And hopefully that student will have started therapy at 11. <laughs> and by the time he reaches graduate school, will be able to take, your on, take this on. Can yeah. I point out parenthetically, uh, as a layperson, how hilarious it is that to, find, to discover that the economists let you call what you do behavioral economics. In other words, if you're doing behavioral economics, what are they doing? Well, I mean, Herb Simon has a wonderful quote, uh, a definition of behavioral economics, mm -hmm. where he, and you may learn a new word here. He says that the phrase seems to be a pleonasm. Uh, which is a redundant phrase. And, um, and he says it, it is so because you might ask, what other kind of economics could there be? Yeah. And then he answers the question. The answer lies in the assumptions of economics. So it's behavioral economics. I mean, it, maybe it should be called human economics. Um, because it's the study of humans in markets, and so far there's only been unicorn economics. One thing that's always puzzled me is about the nature of the resistance to the kind of work that you and those around you were doing is, um, why, again, a, a naive question. Why would economists be threatened by that? Why wouldn't they... What you're doing is you're expanding the horizons of their own discipline and, to put it very kind of crudely, bringing in lots of cool stuff. Why would they object to bringing in lots of cool stuff? So I think there, were, there are two reasons. Um, one, there's a story I tell in the book about a, a guy who went to a talk, an early talk I gave and, uh, at the NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, and he said, you know, if you're right, what am I supposed to do? I know how to solve optimization problems. And I didn't have a very good answer for him. Uh, so that's one answer. Another answer, I think the most vehement objectors to this, uh, the objections were based on politics. And they were based on politics because um, th th these people had a very strong laissez-faire, Milton Friedman, Chicago school kind of view. And the logic is people are optimizers. Therefore, they choose what's best for them. Therefore, they don't need any help. Therefore, anything that the government did would make things worse, mm -hmm. QED. Mm -hmm. Now, for the first 25 years that I was doing research, I religiously avoided doing anything remotely political or poli even policy-oriented because I knew that that was the fear. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, the, uh, Merton Miller, who, who was a colleague of mine for a while and, um, as you know, was not a fan, uh, I think that was his fear, was if you show that markets are not perfectly efficient, then somebody in Washington is going to want to do something. Um, and whatever that was, he wouldn't like. Mm -hmm. And now it wasn't our agenda. And you know, even if you fast forward to, say, to Nudge, the book I wrote with Cass Sunstein in 2008, I mean, you know, that was hardly a radical book. I mean, we said, what things can you do to improve people's outcomes without uh, restricting their choices? We, we called it libertarian paternalism. 
knowing that it might piss off some people who think of themselves as libertarians, but, but we did mean choice preserving. And, um, you know, that, that's about as unradical as one can possibly be. And yet, it did infuriate some on the right who, who think that we're meddlers. Um, so I think, uh, I think that the most, certainly the most vehement objectors tended to have very strong free market views. It isn't just, <clears throat> objections don't just come from within the, your profession, though. They come, my, some of my favorite parts of the book, my favorite chapter of the book as a football fan is your chapter about football, which well, I want to talk is about. the best chapter in the book. Oh. It, because it's really fascinating because you realize that you're dealing with something that's, it's, this isn't just a, a faculty fight. It's a, it's a problem that lots and lots of smart people have with making sense of the world. So t tell me about your findings. Let's start, let's start with the, the Cade Mass, the paper you did with Cade Massey about uh, the draft. Give us a, just a little. Uh, okay, so the, actually to even make this segue cleaner, the, there was an article about me in the University of Chicago alumni magazine. And um, it's a very Chicago thing to do. They're writing an article about me, so they interview Gary Becker. Uh, who's the, the late Gary Becker, he uh, died last year, a very nice, uh, uh, very nice gentleman. And um, they asked him what he thought of behavioral economics, and he said, and this is almost a verbatim quote, it doesn't matter if 90% of the people can't calculate probabilities, the 10% who can will be in the jobs where that matters. Mm -hmm. So, to me, that was like a challenge. Okay, let's see if that's true. So, football teams are owned by billionaires. In fact, they have a spare billion, right? One of the reasons neither of us own a football team is we don't have a spare billion. Um, so, they have a spare billion to buy a football team. Mm -hmm. They have payrolls of over 100 million a year, just for their players. You would think this is high enough stakes, right? This is big business. So, uh, Cade and I, Cade was a student of mine, we thought, uh, okay, let's study that. And there's a, there was, so, we won't get too deep into football, which Malcolm and I are easily capable of doing, uh, though it would be a welcome diversion from psychotherapy. <laughs> but, You've got to move to safer and safer ground. Yeah, thank you. Um, from the, Freud to Roger Goodell. So, so, <laughs> so uh, as I'm sure almost everyone but my wife knows, the... Uh, each year, the teams have a draft of players, and the worst team picks first, and so forth, and there's seven rounds. And the interesting thing about that is there's a market for picks. So you can trade the first pick for, say, half a dozen second round picks. Not all at once, but that's what the market says. Now, that implies that the first pick is five times more valuable than an early pick in the second round. That seemed like a lot, especially given that the first picks get paid a lot, a lot more than the guys in the second round. So they would have to be really, really better. And so we did a big analysis that you have to buy the book to get or download the paper for free. Um, but it's full of equations. You really don't want to go there. Um, and what we found is that if you compute the surplus a player provides to his team, meaning 
how good his performance is, how much it would cost to get a player that good, mm -hmm. minus how much you have to pay him. And really, since there's a salary cap in football, the only way you can win is to get players that perform better than what you're paying them. That's the only way to win. And so what we found is these second round picks are actually more valuable than that first pick. But you could get five of those for that pick. It's the biggest anomaly I've ever found. And now the interesting thing is, you know, we, Kate and I have now, we're on our third team that we've done some work for. Uh, the first one, we fired them. Um, it was the Washington Redskins. Um, it was early in Dan Snyder's tenure as owner. And I met him and he said, oh, we didn't want to know about this. And he introduced me. He said, I'm going to send my people to see you. And they flew out to Chicago and met with Kate and me, and we told them what our findings were. And we basically have two pieces of advice. Trade down and lend picks this year for picks next year. Because they have this interesting rule of thumb. If you, get, if you give up a third round pick this year, you get a second round pick next year. So it's a one round interest rate. If you compute the real interest rate, it's 137% per year. <laughs> so these guys did not get to be billionaires borrowing at 137% per year, yeah. but that's the rule of thumb they use. So anyway, we taught his guys, Stan's guys, what to do, and then we watched the draft eagerly that year, and they traded up and borrowed a pick this year for one next year. So. Okay, but um, has it, so has so, anyone yeah ever done the pure Taylor Cassie? No, I mean so um, uh, the Patriots are not surprisingly as good at this as anybody. Mm -hmm. um, the one problem is that the smart teams don't get the overvalued picks. And there's no way, to put it in finance jargon, there's no way to short the first pick. So you and I know that uh, Tampa Bay should have traded the first pick this year instead of taking a mm -hmm. quarterback with, who's been arrested six times. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we don't own a team with the worst record, and the teams with the worst record don't hire us. But it's, it's still the case that very good teams can play the, the interest rate game. They and can, and the Patriots do often play the game of trading a pick this year for a better one next year. So let's, but let's talk about why. So th it's not as if the world of sports, like the world of business in general, is um, a, not full of educated people, and B, completely hostile to analytics. This is what's supposed to be sweeping the world of sports. Right. So what is it specifically about this? Um, and you've said that what you observed was not a trivial difference big. at all. These are huge. Huge. Um, so there are two, to tell you how big this is, if you did this right, what we, we think you would win one game a year more. If, if you also learned to go for it more often on fourth down, another game and a half. So just being smart, mm -hmm. you win at least two games a year on average. It's only a 16 game season. It's shocking. Now, has their behavior, football is the most backward of all the American sports in terms of analytics. Uh, David Romer wrote a famous paper about how you should go for it more on fourth down in 1996. If you plot the frequency of going for it on fourth down since then, flat line. Mm -hmm. Exactly zero learning. Mm -hmm. um, 
in our thing, they've kind of half learned. So I think there's some geek at every team who's read our paper. M mostly, you know, think of the Jonah Hill character in the movie Moneyball, yeah. right? So, and, and nobody pays attention to that guy. And, um, but they've heard some things that it's, you know, not smart to do what the Redskins did a few years ago, which was trade away three first round picks to move up four to get RG3. Hmm. Um, but the teams with the f first picks are still asking those prices. So there's, there's some loss aversion going on. You know what, it resembles exactly real estate markets after the price falls. So in 2008, drive through a tract of the, these condos that were overpriced by a factor of two. And what did you see? For sale, for sale, uh, foreclosed. Now, in a, in a standard economic model, that's not supposed to happen. There should be no more for sale signs in a slump than in a boom. Prices should just adjust until we clear the market. So, but we know people are loss averse. They don't want to sell their house for less than Bernie got for selling his house a year ago. His house wasn't as nearly as good as mine anyway. And why should I take 200,000 less than he got? So that's what uh, Tampa Bay and uh, who was the team with the second pick? Uh, anyway, uh, Tennessee. Um, they were getting offers for their picks, but they were demanding redskin prices. And according to our analysis, I mean, a reporter once asked me, what advice would you give to the team that had the first pick? And I said, have a sale. Announce the pick is on sale for 25% off. And, uh, but no, no team's ever done that as far as I know. How did, does that, does it leave you frustrated? I mean, do you feel like, I go back at your feelings, but yeah, I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what does frustrated mean? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it leaves us frustrated, but I don't think, I don't think it's all that uncommon. Mm -hmm. I've never been in any large organization that was run anywhere close to optimally. Mm -hmm. I had a, a, a young economist come to my office a couple weeks ago, um, and he had written a paper about uh, oil and gas drilling. And he had really good data. And it, the results, I mean, he, you know, he was a recent Harvard PhD, good enough to get an assistant professor job at the University of Chicago. You know, this is a smart young kid. And his analysis was showing that the companies, like in North Dakota, are leaving about half the money on the table. How, when you say? I don't know. I yeah. mean, um, so in, in the techniques they're using. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you know about the publishing world. I won't, I won't ask you what you think of that world, but I would say less than optimal. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? So, and uh, certain, you know, so I, I think, I'm not sure that um, football teams are that much worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're bad, but, um, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not, not worse, than, uh, so much worse than. Well, you have a story in the book about uh, an encounter you had with General Motors. <laughs> Yeah, 
Well, that was a long time ago. It is a funny story, but so back, this was like in the 1980s, um, when, uh, rebates were still kind of new. Mm -hmm. and, but they were a wearing off a little bit. And um, somebody got the idea, how about if we offer low interest rate loans to sell the cars in the summer, the excess inventory that they built up? So uh, General Motors uh, offered the then outrageously low interest rate of 2.9%. Mm -hmm. And interest market rates were over 10 at that point. So th and then I, I know, and, and this worked unbelievably well. People, there were stories in the newspaper of people lying on the hood of cars saying, this is mine. Uh, so, right, a phenomenal success. And I saw this little article in the Wall Street Journal saying, actually, you had a choice. You could take the financing or the rebate. If you take the rebate and finance at the market rate, you actually save more money. Mm -hmm. So they were offering this financing deal that was selling cars like crazy, and it was worse than the, uh, the other deal they had on the table. So I started to think about that. Well, why might that be? And then I had an idea, which was based on simple psychophysics. Um, you know, the rebate was, say, $600 from a $20,000 car. And, but the financing was less than a third of the interest rate. That's a deal. 600 off a car, ah, you know, but one third off the financing. Mm -hmm. So I told a friend of mine about that who had a consulting job at General Motors and uh, he said, oh, write that up. So I wrote up a little one page thing explaining what I just explained to you. And I got a call from a guy at General Motors. Can I come talk to you? So he comes and talks to me, and talk to him, and explain. You know, I, I said, you don't have to come really see me really, but. He, I explained this thing to him, and then they invited me to Detroit. And I had the Roger and me experience of going to that, that gigantic building with mm -hmm. cars in every lobby. And, and I said to them, um, well, who was in charge of figuring out why that deal worked last summer? And the guy said, I don't, I don't know, but I had eight appointments with vice presidents that day, and one of them will know. So at the end of the day, it turned out nobody had that job. This cost something like $700 million, this promotion, in $1980. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty sure at that point I didn't want a consulting job for General Motors. But they said, would you write up your recommendations? So I said, sure. So I basically recommended two things. One, they figure out why this worked. And two, they figure out what they're going to do next summer. Because it's likely other companies will copy this. So about a month later, I got a letter from General Motors saying, we've decided against your proposal. <laughs> and uh, so I called the guy up and I said, I'm curious. what." Why is it? Because I wasn't suggesting I do that. Mm -hmm. So get somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, oh, well, we decided um, we don't need to do that because we've decided we're going to manage our inventories better, and we won't have any more sales at the end of the year. Silver excess, which has never happened. Which has never happened. Yeah. No. Well, I'm reminded of um, there's a great passage in a uh, paper maybe that Albert Hirschman wrote in which he makes this observation that the, this kind of um, short-sightedness, foolishness, whatever, irrationality can be very useful. So he made the point that you know, when you look at major capital infrastructure projects, everyone, governments always underestimate how they're going to cost, how much they're going to cost. And he says, actually, that's incredibly useful because if you were accurate in your estimation of how much they would cost, you'd never do them, 
right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering whether when you look at this array of, of misbehavior by um, human actors, um, what are the uses? What do we get out of, what does the NFL owner get out of being nonsensical about the draft? Or what does General Motors get from not? Well, you know, yeah, I, I'm not sure they get anything. I mean, what is true, Danny always used to say that the way to become a general in the Israeli army was to be overconfident and lucky. Um, so you, you do two foolish things mm -hmm. and luck out, and then you become a general. And that's a good way also to become CEO. It also helps if you're quite tall. Yes. So uh, it probably helps to be a general too, but it certainly helps to be a CEO. Neither of us, Better it's good, qualified. yeah, yeah, we're not good looking enough either. <laughs> so, um, so I think overconfidence helps you become CEO, but uh, it's really bad to have an overconfident CEO. There's a nice study that oh, overconfident CEOs pay more for acquisitions and they do worse. And um, so I, I don't think that there's an upside. I mean, it, the, the, the one upside could be we probably have more innovation because of overconfidence. Mm -hmm. Because most new businesses fail and some of the lucky ones succeed. And, you know, some of those are Steve Jobs. But of course, Steve Jobs got fired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering whether, I'm not satisfied with that answer. So, uh, damn, I was never a good <laughs> student, you know? But let's, let's go back to the NFL owners for a moment and think about that. What do they get out of that? What they get out of it is, um, if they all behave irrationally in the same way, they have a, it, it becomes, that's the basis of their club. That's one, right? Yeah. And the other thing is, specific to the draft, they preserve, since they're also, in the, it, they've preserved the kind of, there's a theatricality to the draft, right? What you're suggesting is, look, the whole excitement and thrill that, uh, that is associated with the number one pick is, uh, Meaningless, get rid of it. What you really want is something. No, 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 no. I, I'm, no, look, I, actually, the, here's an even bigger puzzle about the draft yeah. that we didn't write about, which is virtually every pick should be traded. And, and so here's the reason. Let's, let's, suppose, let, let's suppose that the best player in the draft is Jameis Winston. Mm -hmm. Now, the, whatever team values him most should acquire that pick at a rational price. And that should happen for each pick. It would be pure coincidence if the team that valued the best player happened to have the first pick. So we should have 25 trades in the first round rather than three or four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason why we don't have more is partly that the prices are wrong and people don't want to pay the wacky prices. But if we had right prices, we'd have way more trading. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I, I don't think it's any kind of uh, inadvertent conspiracy conspiracy. No, I didn't mean to suggest that. I was trying to suggest that there are kind of, are there, I was really posing it as a question, are there are kind of um, social and psychological goods that outweigh performance for people in, so if you think of, the thing that's interesting about the NFL and CEOs and these groups we're talking about is that they are, they evaluate themselves in their own performance, not merely in the broad market terms, how well is my company or my team doing, but also in the fraternity of those like them. So, no. I mean, with NFL owners, yeah, no, I maybe we're underestimating saying. the extent to which they derive their real satisfaction in life, not from winning the most number of games, but from being firmly a member of the fraternity of NFL owners. Yeah, I, I, so from the three owners I've gotten to know, I yeah. would reject that hypothesis. Yeah. 
They, if anything, they want to win too badly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and right now. And I think that causes, that plus overconfidence. So they may accept the truth of what you're saying, but say, I can, I'm smart enough to be the exception. You know, they, it's like we get to the point where they, uh, they understand it in a cold state a week before the draft. Mm -hmm. And then there's a player they're convinced is going to transform their team. And, and they're absolutely sure that every other team feels the same way, and they just can't resist. And they trade up three picks to get that guy, and then he gets hurt before the season. How has that line of research affected the way that you hire? Uh, it's made me even less underconfident. Uh, so look, I know, and, and my colleagues should know, uh -huh. that interviews are useless at forecasting virtually anything. And, but when we're hiring new assistant professors, people have really strong opinions. And, and, and they're completely wacky strong opinions. They think that every paper this guy or this gal is going to write will be just like that one. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, do you remember your thesis? It wasn't that great. And it's nothing like what you're working on now. Why is it that you think this person should write an earth-changing thesis and will never change? Mm -hmm. But uh, here's the number from the football paper I think is the most memorable and best takeaway for anybody who has to hire people. If you take all the players at a given position and rank them in the order in which they were picked, the chance the one picked earlier is better than the next one is 52%. Slightly better than coin flips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that tell us about paying a CEO $20 million? How confident? I would argue that football teams have way more information in evaluating prospective players than companies have in a hiring CEOs, especially ones from the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the, you know, the football teams, they get to watch them in college for three years, at least in football, and then they bring them to the combine where they have all these tests. No CEO, you know, imagine if we could have CEOs First, we get to watch every decision they've made in the first 20 years of their career, and then we bring them to on tape. In, on tape, tape, right? Yeah. And and you know what was his move when he had to fire that yeah. you know that marketing director? And then we bring them to Indianapolis and run them through a battery of tests for three days. CEO combine. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. So I mean, it, it's I don't think it's even arguable. Uh -huh. that that task is easier than evaluating a manager. And so the odds of being right are probably even worse. But, but think about this in the context of uh, a graduate school. Does this suggest that, let's talk about the University of Chicago graduate, uh, economics department. Uh, does this suggest that you should uh, take in more students with a lower, have a, have a, be less selective at the point of entry? Well, I think, so th th this is another theme that I talk about in the book and r related to some of the stuff that uh, we've done in the UK in the nudge unit, is every organization should be doing more experimenting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, Gene Fama and I disagree about many things about financial markets. One thing, one of many things we agree about is business schools should go back to taking some students right out of college. When he and I started teaching, that was common. Last night I had dinner with one of our alums who was a University of Chicago undergrad 
and did a five-year program we used to have. And so he had an MBA at 22. He was a managing partner at Goldman Sachs at 27, 28, and was rich enough to basically quit and go to work for Mike Bloomberg uh, in the beginning of the Bloomberg mayor administration for a dollar a year. Mm -hmm. there, there are dozens. Most of our most successful alumni were like that. We take none like that. You, know what, you want to know why? Business Week. Business Week, about 20 years ago, started rating business schools. Mm -hmm. One of the factors they use, starting salary. Well, 29-year-olds earn a lot more than 22-year-olds. So no undergraduates get taken. So Gene and I, for 20 years, have been lobbying. Let's take 30. You know, I'm and not sure I'm following the logic. The, the idea of taking an undergraduate is, how is that a, re a reflection of what you've been talking about? You mean you're willing to take a chance on that? Yeah, and do, do something completely different. Mm -hmm. Now, the, it, the conventional wisdom is, if you haven't had five years of work experience, you're not ready to do an MBA. Well, that wasn't true 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you most of their work experience is bogus. I mean, it, it's like a contest. Who can write the best fiction about what they were doing? I, I did something in my class one year. This, I, this is more misbehaving. I had everybody in my class go look at the essays they wrote to get into business school. And then I said, uh, and they, you know, they have them on their laptops. And then I said, OK. Uh, to what extent would you say, on a five-point scale, from you know complete bullshit to the, uh, uh, the honest truth, where would it be? And most people agreed to somewhere deep toward the bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, th th this is admitting them themselves. So you know. You, you want to, anybody here want to go to business school? I'll tell you the essay to write, you know. What, what I've been doing, I've been managing a startup company, blah, blah, blah. And what do I want to do? Well, after I make my fortune, I want to go to Africa and build schools and uh, clean toilets. And that'll get you in. What? It's worth 50 points on the GMAT. But why is it? Why 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 would no, the real rational response to that be? Um, we have a minimal level of qualification, and then we just take names out of a hat. Well, I mean, we, we know that if we used a statistical model, we would do better. Mm -hmm. But we insist on interviewing students. You know, we've known that. How long have we known that? Sixty years. So what happens when? you and Eugene Fama make these suggestions at University of Chicago. Well, everybody knows we're you know, two old guys that don't know anything. <laughs> I come back to how that makes you feel. <laughs> He's older. <laughs> I mean, it's, you're, 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 in this, uh, you're in this kind of marvelous conundrum, which is that the continued existence of opposition to your ideas proves your point. In other words, if People started to agree with you. Nice one, Malcolm. I knew you'd get to <laughs> something good here. When, when the world starts to agree with you, then it's over for behavioral economics. It's sort of. Yeah. You know, my father was an actuary. <laughs> I, I know the mortality tables. I'm not worried. We're, we're running out of time, but I did want to. Um, will you please tell us something about your childhood? Come on. What? Just a little. You read a book. No, I say this because I, I um, uh, think this is a truly magnificent book. I feel like this has taught me more about uh, what happened in the world of economics and making sense of people in the last 30 years than almost anything else I've read. And I'm curious. You know, it's really funny. So uh, our mutual friend, Michael Lewis, um, is 
well, he claims at least he's writing a review of this book. And I talked to him on Saturday. And he said, I have three questions for you. And the first one was, what were you like as a kid? So have, have, you, have you, you two been like colluding, you know? So, I, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I played a lot of sports, not particularly well, and was uh, like a B-plus student. Do you think being a B-plus student it was an important fact in forming your psychology? <laughs> no, listen, don't look at me like that. This is an important point. Someone who has always been the, the A-plus student, this, the, court, the, uh, the obvious smartest kid in the room, the right. golden boy, is someone who is, who is not um, powerfully motivated to disrupt the status quo. Right. 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 No, so this I see is where a... you're going. I see where you're going. Look, no, I think it's an obvious point that if I were, if I had been really good at doing economics, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had to do this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, Sherwin Rosen, my advisor, I quote him. In, the, uh, in, in an article in the New York Times, he told the reporter who asked about my career as a grad student, quote, we didn't expect much of him. <laughs> and you, It's always good to have you know, your advisor <laughs> on your side. And in the first few pages of this book, you quote one of your, your dear friend, Danny Kahneman, as describing you as lazy. Yes, which he insists is a compliment. Yeah. Well, which is we'll let him defend that. Which right. is another great insight, I think, into the mindset of behavioral economists that they would think of laziness as a qualification and not a disqualification. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a psychologist, not an economist. That's right. um, I think we're running out of time. We have a bunch of questions, but um, I don't know whether, uh, uh, whether I, mean, I suppose we have a few minutes. Let's pick one or two, and then we'll. Um, oh, this is a question that actually... What it's is this? not about psychotherapy, right? No, no, no. We're, we're, okay. we're finished right. with that. All right. What is the single action um, we could all do that would drive the most social good? I want to modify the question um, and personalize it. Yeah. If we, <laughs> if we made you czar, um, you know, a czar, American economic czar for the next four years, uh, what, what would your agenda look like? You could basically do whatever you please as long as it was, you know, not magical. I, I mean, I don't know whether I have anything profound. I think it's been pure stupidity that we haven't been building roads, bridges, and so forth for the last seven years when we, we could, we can borrow at a negative interest rate and use otherwise idle resources. I mean, it's just mind boggling that we haven't done that. Yeah. And, and you don't have to be a Keynesian to think that. So w whether or not this would stimulate the economy, let's just suppose we do just cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. We have bridges that are all gonna fall down all around the country. We could be building them with construction crews that have nothing to do and borrowing at zero interest rate, and we're gonna have to do, start doing it uh, as soon as the economy picks up when it will cost a lot more. So complete mm -hmm. stupidity. Mm -hmm. Anything else? You could, you're making you czar. I mean, you, uh, you uh, can. Yeah, uh, let's have another question. <laughs> There's a question here for me. <laughs> Whose footprint is on the sole of your gym shoe? We'll leave that one for now. Yeah. Um, how can behavioral, okay, we're gonna end on this note because it's uh, appropriately hubristic. How can behavioral finance help us consistently beat the stock market? I, I, this is the part of the question I love. I emphasize consistently and beat. <laughs> I, say, I, say, I say I have a two-word answer to that. 
It can't. It can't. <laughs> Good. Um, well, on that um, appropriately humble note, um, thank you so much. This was lovely, and thank you all for coming.